This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. The global coronavirus pandemic is weighing heavily on the minds of nearly everyone on the planet. So coming up, we'll talk about how we are coping with it here on the Gulf Coast. This is a special Zoom edition of In Studio. It's probably safe to say that just about everyone is feeling some degree of uncertainty and anxiety these days. The COVID-19 pandemic has raised concerns about health, safety, employment, finances, you name it. In many cases, our contact with others is no longer in person, but on screens and from six feet apart. So joining me to discuss the situation are people who certainly understand how we're feeling. They're on the front line, so to speak, and may be able to provide us with some helpful insight and advice as we all try to cope with COVID-19. So we've got a great panel here. You may recognize Dr. Michael DiMaria. He's been with us before speaking to a number of different mental health topics. Dr. DiMaria is an integrative psychologist, yoga and meditation instructor, as well as a four-time I'm Grammy nominee and Silvio Fina. Silvio has been providing school-based mental health counseling in Escambia and San Rose County since 1994. He's a licensed mental health counselor who has worked in many areas of society. He's worked with incarcerated adults, delinquent youths, and many others while he was in private practice. And Josh Newby. Josh is marketing and communications director at the Council on Aging of West Florida. He's been in this area for many years. He's worked with UWF and Ballinger Publishing, to name a few, and now he's helping the aging and the elderly population in West Florida daily. So welcome, gentlemen. Glad you're all here. Thank you. Thanks for joining us uh, for this show that I'm going to, I think I'm going to unofficially call it Home Studio. What do you think about that? Or Out of Studio, maybe? In Studio. It's really in studio, but we're at home. So for this broadcast, uh, Dr. Di Maria will focus on the general population in our first segment, and then we'll move on to discuss students, teachers, and parents in segment two. And then in segment three, we'll talk about specific issues affecting the elderly. And then in our last 15 minutes, we'll wrap things up and hopefully all learn more about coping with COVID-19. So we hope you'll stay with us for the entire broadcast. So we'll start with Michael. All right, Michael, good to see you. Good to see you, Sherry. This is another new uh, first time here being able to be with you this way because I always enjoy seeing you in studio. But when we're in studio, we're what, maybe two feet apart. So I know that's not allowed right now. Yes. Um, but I'm really glad and I'm, I'm so happy to be here and glad that you and the team have been able to put together the show, even if it's remotely. Well, we're going to give it a shot, see how it goes. So I think it'll, I think it'll be great. So we'll just, we'll start with you and guys listen in. And if you, if you have anything you want to say, feel free. Otherwise we'll kind of, you know, go on through and just see how things go. But um, Michael, you're seeing people um, professionally and personally right now that are, I mean, would you say it's safe to say, I keep hearing people say we're all in this together. It's all, it's all the same boat. These are some cliches, but would you say that it's pretty safe to say that? Absolutely. I mean, and, you know, I think some of the things that are said, we're all in the same boat. We might say we're all in the same river, maybe in different boats. And the only reason I say that is, you know, there are variations that people are experiencing the pressure and challenges right now. There's some people in, in serious economic issues. There's people losing homes. There's people that have lost a job. There are other people it might be that they, it's a, it's a welcome break and breather. But now that we're moving into almost two months, the key is the main themes of all of us facing the fears of getting ill, the fears of our loved ones, particularly our vulnerable loved ones getting ill, is very, very serious. And I think the biggest thing that we're all in the same boat about is that we don't know what's going to happen. And, and I think that's the biggest fear or difficulty is the unknown, which 
since the beginning of time has always been there. It's never gone away. But in modern culture, we tend to lull ourselves into a sense of security. But this is bringing up some of these deep-rooted insecurities that we, we all struggle with and we all live with. So from that point of view, yes, we're in the same boat. So mentally, none of us are immune, so to speak. Not at all. I mean, I, I, I think to me, you know, you hear out there a lot, these two extremes. It's either the end of the world or that it's a hoax and it's not true and there's nothing to be scared of. So I think both of those extremes are a problem. We could kind of say paranoia on the one side and like laughing on the other that there's nothing serious. I talk a lot about right-sizing your fear which means a certain amount of fear is healthy. A fear helps us be attentive, aware, be cautious. And again, if we're going down this boat down a river, you want to be aware of obstacles. You want to portage around the waterfall. So there's some basic things we need to be aware of and concerned of and healthy, appropriate fear. But we don't want to go into what we call catastrophizing or awfulizing when our fear gets out of control. And then we can actually become paranoid. And then we start really, another word I like to use is future tripping, where you start just imagining the worst case scenario. Now, that's not healthy for any of us. So some fear is normal. And absolutely, it's scary being alive on the planet, period. You know, again, we all are here to grow old become sick and eventually die. Unfortunately, in our culture, because we kind of, we're almost death phobic in our culture and what I call grief illiterate, that we tend to divorce ourselves from this. And so there's two sides of this. One is it brings these truths right smack in our face. We can't deny them. And that can be really scary. The other side of it is it's actually an opportunity for some real emotional and spiritual growth. So you're talking about fear and anxiety, and, and you were saying what the difference is there. Right. So fear is fear of something, that there's a clear object. You know, so here we have fear of getting the coronavirus or, or fear of economic instability or fear of a loved one dying. Anxiety is a diffuse, you could almost say fear without an object. Okay, so anxiety is more free floating and that's why it's difficult to address. Of course, fear is difficult if you can't get rid of the feared object, which we can't right now. You know, we can do some basic things to reduce that. So anxiety is a little bit more, you know, difficult in the sense that it's fear without an object. But basically, none of us are immune. These are natural, normal parts of being human. And I think that's a really important thing. And when all of us are facing these kind of situations, it's important to realize being human means to have a certain amount of appropriate fear and even appropriate anxiety. Um, you know, we've talked about being present. You and I have talked off camera um, because when we're projecting out into the future, that's what anxiety. And then when we're thinking back to the past, that can be some depressive type of a situation. So a lot of people haven't really worked on being present. We're so busy thinking to our next thing. And I would think that in a situation like this, it's particularly valuable to learn those skills. What, what are your thoughts on that? Absolutely, Sherry. You know, this is one of our favorite topics we, we talk about, and that is exactly right. You know, focusing on the present is a way of avoiding fear of the future or anxiety about the future and regret about the past, which so often is what occurs. And 90% of thoughts and feelings tend to be focused on future or past. So when we bring ourselves in the present moment, like taking a deep breath, you know, we've done our three breaths to de-stress on other shows and, and it helps us rest in this moment. And it really, again, we can right size the fear. We can focus on what's right in front of us. We call the circle of influence, which is what do I personally have control of in this moment? And that really helps to try to simply reduce those anxieties and fears and focus on what I can do. Let me make a meal. Let me be present to my kids. Let me be able to check in on my, my I'm glad the other, you guys are here too. You know, I have my, my father's 91 at a retirement facility here in town. And, you know, I have my, 
uh, younger nephews and nieces. So it's being present and being with what we can do and have influence on in this moment and today. And that's another reason why I really encourage, outside of this show, not overwatching news, because that tendency to fuel those fears really get out of control. And you can start, it increases a sense of powerlessness, which increases a sense of possibility of either depression or anxiety. Yeah, and that's what I'm hoping this show can be for people, is, is a break from that, um, to say, um, as you said, we're all in different boats, but we, but we are um, in it. And so I, I really, I'm so glad you all are here to provide us with, uh, with some, some insights there and just help us. I saw Josh take a deep breath when you said that. Um, so I think, you know, I think if we can just help people with some, some ideas and suggestions. Well, part of our thing is we're so used to movement, Michael. Absolutely. I mean, this is a key piece. And, and you know, we've talked on other shows about, you know, my background in terms of guiding these vision quests based upon a Native American uh, rite of passage. And this is where you purposely spend time and people used to, you know, pay me a lot of money to help take them out in the middle of nowhere without food and be isolated without phones, without TV, without social media, without anything and be with themselves for three, four days by themselves. And, and this was understood in traditional culture to be an incredibly important part of learning who you are and learning to become resilient in the face of the challenges of life. In fact, you know, to many Native cultures, life is seen as going down a river you've never been down before with great challenges, but also great beauty, and that there's always these twists and turns. So one of the challenges for us in modern culture is we tend to see life as just climbing a mountain. Like I'm going to use my will, I'm going to set this goal, and I'm going to make it happen. Well, life at its core is not that simple. So we're used to actually avoiding ourselves. We're used to not looking within. In fact, most people will really, we, we will, and this including me, this is not easy to look inside and deal with what are those things I've been avoiding? What are those I shared with you when we were preparing for the show, I've spent seven days kind of cloistered going through 40 years of, of boxes of, of materials and books and actually two or three boxes from my mom who passed away a few years ago. And it's been emotional. I haven't really wanted to look through those things, but it's been really powerful these last seven days. So I see us kind of having the opportunity of being on a bit of a global soul initiation or vision quest, meaning that it's a time to reevaluate where we are, where we're going, what's working in our life, what's not. I mean that both in a personal sense for each of us individually, but also in a larger global sense. And so this inability to move and distract ourselves forces us to look within. Now we can either complain and shout and have a tantrum over that, or we can take a deep breath and do the hard work of saying, hmm, you know, who am I? What am I here to do? Where am I really going in my life? There's an old saying, sometimes it's a great stroke of luck to not get what you want. And of course, in our modern society where we can push a button and something from Amazon pops up, you know, on our doorstep, you know, we've really grown, unfortunately, a bit used to getting what we want as opposed to looking within. So, and I do not want to minimize or deny the suffering and the pain and the fear going on. We all have that, including myself. And at the same time, you know, we've talked about it's less what happens to us than what we tell ourselves about what happens to us. So the story we have, the frame we have, the narrative we have about what's happening to us makes a huge difference. So instead of going into these apocalyptic, nightmarish, end of the world stories, which makes us and everyone around us feel horrible and powerless and overwhelmed, to see, hey, what a wonderful gift and opportunity this is to learn more about ourselves and each other and maybe re-examine the way we're living and how can we maybe make some of these changes long term. Wow. Well, and we will come back and we'll talk, uh, address that specifically. It sounds to me like you're saying we can't change what's going on around us, but we can change what's going on inside us, regardless of how terrible the outside is, right? 
Exactly. Okay. So uh, we're going to take a hard look at ourselves and uh, we're going to take a little break here. And when we come back, we're going to focus a little bit more specifically on the issues that are facing students, parents, and teachers. Our show is Coping with COVID-19. You're watching WSRE TV, PBS for the Gulf Coast. We're back and we're talking about the current global pandemic that we're all in the midst of. As I mentioned earlier, Silvio Fina is the coordinator of mental health services with the Escambia County School District's Office of Student Services. Silvio has worked with students for a long time. Silvio, I was, I'm so appreciative of you joining us. And I just, you know, I don't even think that I knew that the Escambia County School District had a mental health department. I mean, is that fairly new? How'd that come about? Would you share that with us? I'd be happy to. Thank you for the invitation. It's good to be with you. If you'll allow me, the Escambia School District is a great place to work and send your students. They will get an exceptional education when they apply themselves. Each of the last 12 school years, our district has improved its scores. And we're to the point now where last year we reached a B as a whole school district, which anyone who knows about the obstacles we overcome in Escambia County, that's nothing short of miraculous. So, you know, I'm just taking the opportunity to brag on the thousands of intentional, dedicated hours by um, you know, employees and parents and students to uh, sort of impose their will over so many obstacles. And, you know, we're not done yet. We want to become an A, but um, it's, it's a great school district. It's, it brings a lot of uh, good to the district. But to answer your question directly, yes, we have a mental health services department. It was uh, put into motion August 2018 in the wake of the tragedy of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. We got some mental health allocation funds and the district decided to do some direct hires for the high schools and we collaborate and coordinate with other mental health community agencies and we now have coverage at all the levels including the alternative and charter schools for mental health counseling right there on site. Wow, that's awesome. I'm so happy to hear that. And I'd like to hook the two of you up sometime. We'll get some of those kids meditating in those schools. I would love to see that. That would be awesome. Well, as a mental health professional, what's one of the most difficult aspects of the pandemic that you're seeing? And, and how's it affecting the mental health of children and parents? Well, this wasn't planned, but I'm piggybacking on Dr. V. Maria because the pandemic has us all thinking globally, that real big thinking. I mean, basically the whole world was and is shut down and that more easily steers us towards that all or nothing thinking where, you know, we're prone to believe things are either all good or they're all bad and we want to choose a side because it's difficult to tolerate the ambiguity. And as a result, that has us all feeling defeated and disappointed and discouraged and disconnected, even disrespected, all the Ds, you know, except for D Dr. D. Maria, that would be good to feel like Dr. D. Maria. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Silvio. Yeah, yes. So, you know, one of the ways, you know, I'll mention a few ways that we can, you know, combat that global thinking that can be so detrimental is, um, you know, talk heals. So it's good if we own, acknowledge, and verbalize we have all those D's and even call them out by name. Um, Cause if we don't, they don't go anywhere but down. And you know, when they surface, they may manifest themselves as addiction, broken relationships, depression, anxiety, and in its worst form, you know, the, the panic, that's a very painful situation. So that's one way to deal with the global thinking. Another way would be to focus on its opposite, the opposite of global thinking is linear thinking, which is why we hear so much about establish a schedule and a routine and try to become absorbed in something like reading or exercising or doing schoolwork or playing board games, getting organized. The trick to that is that we have to employ opposing emotion when we start it and oftentimes right after we start it. And what I mean by that is we can't wait around for the 
feeling to come before we start to try to create order out of our um, chaos now. You know, you make the decision before the feeling arrives and then feelings play catch up. There's a lag time with feelings. It's, it's how we're made. Um, so when we're trying to bring structure to our worlds and get task oriented, we can't wait for the feeling to come. We have to just do it. And then the feelings will catch up. And we even change the way we think about it. Because if you think about when you want to start exercising, you never really want to or even reading until you begin to get absorbed in it. And then you, the way you're thinking is like, oh, this is not so bad. I shouldn't wait so long. And then a um, couple more, if, if I can, is, sure. um, you know, self-compassion is a very good thing. And that's basically where, you know, we treat ourselves and think about ourselves as kindly as we would our best friend. And there's ways to do that. Sometimes it's a reward. If, you know, there's healthy disassociation. Netflix, I think, is one of them. Binging Netflix. Depending on what you're watching, it really gets you to a spot where you're not really aware of, your, you know, thinking those dark thoughts so much. And it allows you to appreciate that you're doing all you can do. We have limited control, like Dr. D. Maria said, and there's no quick fix. And it's the best we can do to tolerate the ambiguity. What so, about the, our students? What, what kinds of things would you suggest to parents to be telling them to be saying, I know even with teenage students particularly, they, they wanted to graduate. There's some of them that have already graduated that are home from college that thought they had been set loose. What, what, what would you say to, to parents of kids of all ages to help them through this situation? Attachment desires. Any desire upon whose fulfillment your happiness depends. Again, it's a chance to refocus and say, you know, what I used to think I needed to be happy is not really what I need to be happy. And, you know, that's a segue into my fourth point on the global thinking is being quarantined provides us an opportunity to switch or shift our thinking from all your value comes from doing and moving and achieving and thinking that we have to have certain things or experience certain experiences in order to be happy. When it's a great opportunity to see the value that we have is can be equally derived from just being and connecting and journeying with others, just, just being present. You know, it's the being on the way together that is the most important. Yeah, it sounds like what Michael was saying about reframing this whole experience. And I think parents can obviously be very influential with their kids. And, and what about the teachers? They, they say everybody seems to be working well together and adjusting. The continuous learning model is going exceptionally well. I think we have discovered a new way to communicate and connect that is not going away, even if we waved a magic wand and we could. The kids like it. You know, I communicate with the different agencies and, and a lot of the counselors we're talking with. And so we've been having these updates. And to the counselor, the kids are fine. Uh, now, I don't know what commentary that means about, you know, the, the, them being out of the social milieu of school or the you know, ex, you know, limited expectations on them academically, but they have adapted and they are surviving and they're finding a way forward. And, and I think the teachers are liking their newfound tool to reach them too. You know, it, it actually, when you're saying these things, um, it almost feels exciting. Um, to be able to reset this button. And um, I, I, you know, you and I had talking, had been talking about, you know, how to help the parents, how to help the kids, how to help the teachers. You know, you may, you may have some more thoughts on that, that, that you want to share here, but it, I'm just telling you, it sounds like an exciting time. Yes. Yeah. 
Any more thoughts on that, gentlemen? Uh, what about you, um, Michael? I know we're going to be talking about the elderly in the next um, segment, but um, is there, you know, is there anything specific facing the teachers and administrators, or um, you just working through it all? Well, I kind of like what you said, and 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 also what Sylvia said. And I actually got, I call them truth bumps, you know, chill bumps when you said, I'm almost excited. I have to say, I think that's a really important piece. And I have, and, and I have lots of friends in the school system and also want to put a huge, uh, you know, positive, you know, shout out to all the teachers and counselors and administrators. I have many friends in, in the education system in Santa Rosa and Escambia County and worked for many years closely with them. And for me, it's actually helping us see what it is that is most important. And that, you know, I was mentioning that to you, Sherry, when we talked about this, that it's almost like going back, you know, to the 50s and 60s, growing up in the 60s, you know, a little town in Connecticut, there was, you know, people would be out walking, you know, and, and everybody would be riding their bikes and, and families spent more time together. And, you know, before we were all on, on this phone and, and that's what I'm seeing. And I think that when I, this idea of how our, our education can change and this idea of working together and that what matters, I mean, I think this is one of the keys is that it brings us to what truly, truly matters, which and Sylvia said it really beautifully is this sense of being on a journey together. And, and it's such a powerful thing that, you know, Hey, Maybe kids can be educated in the homes and, you know, maybe teachers can educate from the home and, and what is it that may be there? And, and I love the idea of how this, this is changing us in ways we don't even understand. And yes, there are, there is pain and there's suffering, there's uncertainty, there's fear. And yet there is also heart opening, mind opening, new creative ideas coming up, new possibilities you know, you know, I'm big into creativity and everything I do. And, and creativity is fueled actually by chaos. That may sound strange, but when I start with the blank canvas or when I start with composing a new bit of music, I feel overwhelmed because there's too many possibilities. You know, what direction do I go? But it's when you start working with the uncertainty that new things come up and then you do something and you don't like it and then you have to adjust. So this is fuel, if we can allow this to be fuel for our creativity, we can really approach it in a healthier way. And, and I'm just seeing tremendous creativity in the teachers I know, the students I know, the parents I know, who initially were really overwhelmed, who are now finding new ways, they're finding new rhythms and, and new ideas. So I'm just, and my hat's off to everyone out there. And I just, you know, want to put a, I, I think the big thing is really, supporting each other, thanking each other, being grateful for each other, that we are finding a way together. And this sounds great and it feels good. We will have children that will have anger or act out. Um, Silvio, you, you know, you mentioned that. Um, are there strategies for coping uh, when we do uh, forget that we're moving forward in a positive way? Yes, you know, more is caught than is taught. And anxiety is no exception. It can be contagious. And perhaps the most efficient way to help a young person with anxiety is for the adult to move in vivo during the normal course of life, through life in a relaxed, muscled body. Because kids are always reading us. They're almost siphoning our emotional life attitudes and beliefs, and they just you know, they will pick up on it. So the adult to do that herself or himself goes a long way. It's like give yourself the oxygen first and then the young person will be able to, you know, pick up on the emotional climate of what's going on. Because basically what anxiety is, and I risk oversimplifying, is the, the person doesn't feel safe within his environment. He doesn't feel safe within himself, real or perceived. He gets all tensed up, squeezing the muscles in his body. At the same time, he'll send himself the message, I can't cope, I can't handle this. And then they, they try, they move towards escape and avoidance behavior, you know, and they can shut down. And so the way to diffuse that is 
you know, Dr. Di Maria's expertise, the somatic quieting, the release your muscles, the deep breathing, the, uh, the grounding, focusing on the here and now, uh, you know, because we can't breathe any other place except in the here and now. So, you know, and then the last point on the anger, um, you know, we, some big things are happening out of our control and control has a lot to do with um, anger or our perceived control. Most of the time it's an illusion, but we welcome those illusions. Um, we've lost the familiarity of our routines. We um, our fans are, you know, suffering financial difficulties. And those are all threats that cause us to feel disrespected and our expectations have been dashed. So my best shot at anger management, it's, it's twofold. Number one, to recognize that most of the anger that's riveting amongst our households is the result of pain reactions, right? Like I'm hurt, so I hurt you and I pass it on to you and, you know, so the solution, is, of course, is, you know, you apologize. I'm sorry. It's not you. I was feeling disrespected. And, um, and, and you know, and if you're on the other side of that, you know, OK, I, you know, you let go of it and, and you move forward. You just keep striving forward and put things behind you. So that's part of the anger. The the other um, angle at anger that I am becoming more devoted to is that between stimulus and response, there is a space. However brief and fleeting you may think it is, there is a space. And if we try to anchor ourselves in that space, if we notice that space, if we, uh, then we can freely choose to either respond or not respond to the person or the situation according to our values. Right, right, right. It's all, all good points for really for everybody, right? And so we're going to take a quick break and we're going to come back uh, with Josh and, and speak a little bit more about the elderly and the aging and their issues there. And uh, so we'll take a quick break and be right back. Welcome back. This is a special Zoom edition of In Studio on WSRE TV. We're going to focus our attention a little bit more now on the elderly. So we're going to uh, talk with Josh Newby to address this just a little bit more specifically. We appreciate um, Josh being here. He's um, been involved with the Council on Aging of West Florida, correct? And we've seen you around town in other capacities, but you really are on the, the front lines right now because you, I would imagine, are fielding calls about aging uh, people and the elderly and um, facilities around town. Tell us what life's been like for you uh, and for the elderly lately. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, we all know that the elderly uh, have been sort of disproportionately affected by this pandemic, at least in a, in a physical sense. Um, and we're hearing a lot of fear. We're hearing a lot of anxiety, of course, issues that we've been talking about today, um, especially for those living at assisted living facilities or nursing homes. They haven't been able to receive visits from their family or friends. They've been very much cut off from the rest of the world, uh, which only, uh, you know, accomplishes a sort of fuel to the fire, whatever uh, fear they were feeling about the pandemic is now multiplied by being sort of cut off from the world. Obviously, they see on the news what is happening in larger cities, um, and it's it's scary for them. They can't reach out in ways that they are able to, in ways that they are used to. A lot of seniors are not very adept at technology. So whereas you and I may just, you know, FaceTime our, our mother and father or FaceTime our grandparents to stay in touch with them, uh, they're not comfortable with that, right? They're, they're used to that face-to-face -face and, and they've been unable to do that recently. Uh, additionally... Well, you know, and, and one thing that we've talked about, and I'm trying to get my volume up here a little bit. Um, one thing that we've talked about for years has been for the, for the elderly and the aging. I know Michael mentioned his dad's um, in assisted living, my mother is as well. Um, we've all known that it's so important to have the physical and social engagement 
that that we're not able to have now. And people have gotten creative through windows and and all of that. It's still not the same, but um, you know, I, I, so we're accustomed to those hugs, and we're we are grieving. Not really a big substitute for that, but how are we starting to get back into that and realize new ways of being with our parents that can't maybe hug the grandkids right now? You know, uh, it's funny because Council on Aging has been preaching for years, uh, you know, don't become socially disengaged, don't withdraw into yourselves as, as naturally happens. And now, of course, we're having uh, to sort of reverse course and say, for now, you do need to socially distance. You you do need to sort of disengage a little bit. And um, I'll give credit to uh, to Dr. Josephs at, at Lakeview Center. Um, he compared it to a grieving process. You know, especially in the South, we're used to hugging. We're used to very close family gatherings, and missing out on that is very similar to the grieving process. Um, and so, allowing yourself to feel those feelings of grief uh, is extremely important right now. That's how we process this uh, as humans. Um, some coping mechanisms that we have uh, recommended is, of course, number one, you have to take a break from the news. You have to take a break from social media. Um, I'm guilty of this myself. You turn on the news and it's just, it's, it's addictive. You're, you become addicted to that new information even though the information isn't really new, right? It, it's, it's just information packaged in a different way to seem new. Um, so, you know, take a break from the news, take deep breaths, meditate, be alone with your thoughts for 15 or 20 minutes every day um, and allow your, your brain the space to really process that. Um, additionally, we wanna make sure that we're eating healthy, going for a walk once or twice a day, getting enough sleep, you don't want to make it any harder on yourself than it already is. Um, so just those very basic steps that we've been told all our lives, make sure you're following that because that's going to make it a lot easier on you physically, um, but also mentally. And also if you have any grandkids who may be willing to help you out with some of the technology, um, let them help you FaceTime, let them help you Zoom. That's, that's extremely important to see uh, our, our family and friends, even if it's just on a computer screen. Yeah. Um, what are some ways that we can reach out to the, to the elderly population right now? Yeah. I, well, the first is, you know, we all know someone elderly, whether it's a family or, or a friend, um, give them a call just call them right out of the blue and ask them how their day is going. And I guarantee you, they will tell you and it will be an experience for both of you. Um, additionally, work with your churches, uh, your, your, your local organizations, if you're involved with any local organizations, a lot of churches has done a great job of setting up phone trees for some of the more isolated seniors. Um, and if you have a neighbor or you have someone that you meet at the grocery store or someone like that you, that you don't really know, but you want to make sure that they are remaining healthy, give us a call. Give Council on Aging a call. We have started a telephone reassurance program and anyone can get signed on to that. We will give them a call. We'll talk to them for five minutes, for 50 minutes, however long it takes to, to, to put their mind at ease. Wow, that's so reassuring. And there's is that, is that the disaster distress helpline or is that a different number? So that's different. The, the disaster distress helpline is for someone who feels like they're sort of at a breaking point, right? They're starting to have some, some dark thoughts and they don't necessarily trust themselves anymore. I would, I would encourage people to give that helpline a call if your thoughts have sort of gone to a darker place. That number is mm -hmm. 1-800-985. 5990, but you can give our office a call at Council on Aging, 432-1475. If you want to just have a weekly check-in call, uh, mm -hmm. if you want to maybe sign your neighbor up or a fellow churchgoer for a weekly check-in call, we'll see how they're doing. Um, and if their condition is deteriorating, we can send someone out there and actually intervene if necessary. So even if they don't have family in town, um, there are, or your organization is looking out for people all over the community, correct? Yeah, we, we will be their family. We want to be the ones there for them because maybe their spouse has passed away. Maybe their kids no longer live here. They want a local voice, a local face, a local friendship. We'll provide that. 
And you're providing meals as well, because you mentioned how important nutrition is. Absolutely. Um, a lot of seniors are still wary about going to the grocery store. Uh, and of course, even if you make it out to the grocery store, they may not have what you're looking for, you know, if it's eggs or chicken or milk. Um, so we are delivering meals on wheels. That's a service that we've always provided. But now you can just call us again at 432-1475 and we can get you signed up for that right away. There's no wait list. Um, there's no income requirement. A lot of people think, you know, maybe I make too much money to qualify for this. Give us a call. We'll bring healthy, nutritious meals to your home. So you don't have to endanger yourself by going out. You know, that is so awesome because I think even as things open, that is still a very, um, the, the population needs to be very careful and not say, woohoo, the grocery store's open. I'm going to just run right in. I, I think even after slowly opening, uh, that's going to be important for the seniors to continue to reach out. Uh, to you with that. And you said companionship is available? Companionship. Um, now, this is both the phone reassurance program that I was talking about, um, and it's actually someone that will come to your home, uh, watch TV with you, chat with you. Of course, we make sure these individuals are healthy. They'll be wearing their mask. They'll be wearing their gloves. But sometimes you just need a physical connection even if it's only for a few minutes. As humans, we are wired to be social creatures. Um, and this pandemic, I think, has really highlighted that. So we will send a companion to your home to spend some time with you, talking about the good old days, watching TV, or maybe just sitting in silence on the front porch. You know, Sometimes it just helps to know that someone is there, that someone is with you. Um, so we provide both that in-person companionship and that sort of uh, a digital companionship as well. Wow, that's awesome. Well, um, you know, you, you mentioned not to be shy, not to, be, you're not alone, right? Absolutely. And, you know, I think a lot of seniors, um, because of the generation that they belong to, they're used to being self-sufficient. Um, they're shy about asking for help. They believe in, um, you know, doing as much as you can yourself. This, this is not the time to do that, right? This is not the time to be shy reach out to your network of help. And if you don't have a network, contact us at Council on Aging and we will be your network. Now is the time to say that you can do it yourself. We're here to do it with you. Yeah, that's great. Um, you mentioned, you know, a lot of these um, places that some of the older people are living are doing crafts we carefully. Um, happy hours? Yes. yes. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I've seen, I am not a creative person at all. Uh, and I personally don't enjoy crafts, to be honest. But this whole quarantine thing has has made me reconsider that. Um, do a craft. We are putting crafts up on our Facebook page, a video of crafts. You can follow along with that video. There's a lot of different stuff online. Do a craft. Do some home exercises. If that's chair squats, if that's leg raises, these things will help you with your balance as well. It'll kill time. It'll keep you healthy. And it'll keep you from falling or stumbling. And then a lot of churches um, are doing uh, sort of morning coffees or, or afternoon dinners via Zoom. So you can get 30 of your, you know, your fellow churchgoers on your computer screen, eating a meal together, having coffee together. Not the same as, um, as being in the room with them, but uh, I got to tell you, it helps. It, it, it definitely helps to have that sort of interaction. Yes, I'm sure it does. And, you know, I, I would um, hope that, um, and we're about out of time in this segment, but that Michael, that it's hard to get the older population, I've tried and tried and tried to, to do some meditating, to do some reframing. There, you know, as we get older, sometimes we can be more rigid. What would you say to anybody that's listening that might be having some questions about their parents and saying they, you know, they're, I could help them, but they won't listen? Do you have any thoughts there? Yeah, and I just want to echo everything Josh said. Those are wonderful recommendations, and I'm thrilled to know about all those resources. I, I might be having my dad call you, Josh, <laughs> but he's, well, we've gone. I mean, one thing I've done is, you know, we would check in every few days, but he needs to talk every day right now. And, and I, 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 you know, he really went through a period of adjustment and, and, you know, again, my, my mother's gone, so he's by himself in a one room apartment and he's really been isolated. I haven't seen him for two months. And 
he had such a hard time doing the face time the first time it's like he was holding it towards the ceiling <laughs> i don't see you <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. we you basically i would say is hang in there keep a sense of humor and also really try to work with them uh, i've really tried to have a good sense of humor with my dad because it can be hard it, hard of hearing and it's difficult with the technology um, the other thing is nothing wrong with sending them a card yeah he only lives across the bridge but you yeah. know that generation loves getting cards or letters and the other thing I've started to do is, you know, I'm finding some like letters between he and my mom or pick from his, his brother who's passed away. And I'm just texting them to him, you know, or, or sending him little emails with some really nice memories. The one piece about meditation where they may be resistant, I remind people meditation is nothing more than, you know, really non judgmental present moment awareness of what is. So somebody can meditate with a craft so we really call it more mindfulness you know and so getting them into like he's really started doing some you know the adult coloring books or the painting or just even kind of doing something that brings their fo focus into the here and now in a non-judgmental way so also keeping something that's not too challenging or overwhelming so that is meditative so trying to get you know ask him anything that they may enjoy doing that's a repetitive simple mindful practice can be really really wonderful and i'm, yeah. I'm reminded of what mother Teresa said it's not a matter of doing great things it's a matter of doing small things with great love so even if it's preparing a meal for themselves or you know maybe writing a letter to a nephew or or niece you know who may never have gotten a letter <laughs> before because we do all these emails so i think stay creative keep it simple and it's really more important i'm finding we're talking more often but for less amount of time and that's also wonderful it's amazing what even like josh said a, a five minute phone call with my dad is meaning a whole lot more to him yeah. than an hour long weekly phone call Absolutely. Josh, we appreciate what you're doing there. We're going to continue to scroll those phone numbers for folks. And uh, we'll be back in that in, in uh, just a few minutes. So if you have anything to add, feel free. But we really appreciate, um, appreciate your time and all of your insight there. And so we're going to take another short break and we'll be back in just a moment. Stay right here. Well, this is a special Zoom edition of In Studio. We're talking coping with COVID-19. And uh, so just really quickly, Josh, we wanted to uh, talk about the caregivers. They need a little respite. Yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, caregivers are overlooked in our society in general, uh, even before this pandemic happened, and especially now as the focus has been on the elderly. Um, but caregiver burnout is very real. Uh, it definitely happens. Um, caring for your loved one, whether that's your parents or grandparents, uh, it can frankly be exhausting on top of everything else you have going on. A lot of our caregivers, uh, their parents or grandparents uh, or aunts or uncles are living with them through this pandemic. So they really need respite. They really need some help. Uh, and we're here to provide that help. We can provide that respite if, you're, if your parent or grandparent has Alzheimer's or dementia, um, any sort of cognitive impairment such as that, or you just need help taking care of them, um, we can do that. Give you a break, give you a physical break, a mental break. There's nothing wrong with taking a break. Um, caregivers out there, please take the help that we uh, provide. You deserve respite, especially during this time. Thank you. Thank you for that service. And um, we'll continue to let everybody know what that phone number is. Thank you. And Silvio, you had some thoughts. I did. Thank you. We are all currently acquiring our own COVID-19 narrative. And in vivo, as it's occurring, it's very helpful if we can tell somebody, this is what's happening to me during COVID-19. And if you can be that the listener to somebody's story, it's the narration that helps the person process it and move through it. So that would be something good you could do for somebody. And to uh, echo Dr. De Maria, uh, you know, things can't hurt us if we can laugh at them. And there's some sharp contrast here, you know, I'm not diminishing anybody's pain or suffering, but humor is the 
you know, the is and the is not being presented at the same time, and this all should not be happening. It's quite absurd. So there's, it's a rich environment for humor when it's, uh, you know, appropriately sensitive. Right. I love that. And my girlfriend in San Francisco has been quarantined longer than anybody. And she's been sending me quite humorous um, information about that. And you have to laugh. And I've told my daughter, we're just going to laugh, but we're going to cry too. Uh, we're totally sensitive to everything that's going on. But um, Michael, you've actually called it an amazing opportunity. Absolutely. And I, I do want to echo on the laughing and crying because what's really powerful when we're put in these situations, and to be honest with you and people on a vision quest, when you're out in the wilderness solo for a few days without food, a lot of laughing and crying happens. And, and, and there's something powerful about laughing and crying. There's actually a yoga, you know, I teach laughter yoga and I'm actually the facilitator for the Gulf Coast Laughter Yoga Club. Oh, didn't um, know that. And you can check it out on Facebook. Yeah. And to, to even laugh for no reason can be powerful. And in, in, in studies actually show it's full bodied rolling belly laughter, which also is a very similar place we cry from. And there's an interesting thing in laughing and crying in all seriousness that requires surrender. It helps us get out of our head and into our bodies, which is such an important part of the process right now. How can we get out of our heads into our bodies? And laughing and crying both in that way to me have a form of grace to them because they allow us to move out of this rational, logical, strategic way of trying to solve problems. And ultimately, the great problems in life aren't solvable, aging and death. And when we realize that life is no longer a problem to solve, but a journey to be experienced and lived and a mystery to behold. And these are two things that laughing and crying allow us. So I really, the, the importance is feel all of who you are. Feel what's happening. And as Silvio has said over and over again, so important, and tell your loved ones. Tell somebody. And if you're out there and you don't have anyone to tell, tell your journal, because we often say therapy is the talking cure, but journaling is the writing cure. So there's something about feeling and then expressing. Feeling and expressing, to me, are similar to breathing in and out. And it helps us become more fully human. And it deepens our relationships. It deepens our journey. And we talked about this, Sherry, when we first talked about the show is, yes, one of the gifts, one of the silver linings of this process is what I call deepening. You know, and, and it happens particularly, you know, I've played my flutes for people in hospice and for my mother. And there's something when you're going through a process like being with a loved one who's dying, it's a deepening process. You know, I always say a broken heart is an open heart. And it also makes you more, more fluid and more flexible and more open-minded. And this is what we need more than ever. And once again, being open-hearted and open-minded makes you more adaptable and makes you more creative. And that's really the key to resilience is adaptability, the ability to flow like a river with whatever arises. So I really want to let folks know is, again, not minimizing or denying suffering, suffering, but there's an inconvenient truth to life, and that is emotional and spiritual maturity require a certain amount of suffering. I'm not talking about gratuitous suffering. When you are beyond what you can handle, you need to ask for help. You need to reach out for help, but it will also help you become more compassionate. And I think that's the other thing we're seeing is tremendous parts of us, uh, our society becoming more compassionate. Um, so I have a lot of relatives in Italy and they went through a lot of this early on. And I have a cousin who's lost her father to COVID in Italy. And you know, the beauty of watching them, you know, clap for the people who are getting through it and kind of over it. And they were sending me the picture of the 101 year old woman who was being rolled mm -hmm. out of the hospital from surviving yeah. COVID. Yeah. So these are the narratives or the COVID stories Silvio was talking about. So we will all have our story. Um, and I think if we keep our hearts open and we keep fluid and flexible and we allow the suffering not to make us bitter, but to transform us and grow us. You know, there is reason to be optimistic. 
Well, and again, the the reframing of it. Um, I saw a video um, calling it the great realization, and I kind of like that. Um, Some of us may not want to go back to the way life was before. We might want to try to take more meaning from this, and I hope that that's what people will come to, that great realization. Absolutely. I love that. And that actually, there's two other terms called the great work and the great turning that people a lot in the ecology movement and what's called eco psychology is that we are in a period of great transition on the planet when we realize the way we have been living is not sustainable. And to see the kinds of changes in the environment from just this short amount of time the problems in our world are solvable if we work together and for the benefit of the whole. I always like to say when we work from the heart, we work for the whole. And that's something that unfortunately in our contemporary culture, you know, through, I don't think there's been anybody, there's no special they out there. It's results of the industrial revolution that changed the way we live and also made people, you know, first go to the cities and then build highways and move to the suburbs. And then we're all in these cars and we're kind of becoming an opportunity. And I know some people have different feelings about this, but becoming a world village, you know, that, that we have an opportunity to reach out and touch and that we're all experiencing a global species wide anxiety and fear makes us realize that we we are more alike than different and that there are things that go beyond national and ethnic and gender barriers or even religious barriers that there's some commonality we have as being fragile human beings that need each other so I do. I, and, and by the way, you know, if you look over history, uh, even things like the bubonic plague and the Spanish flu, each one of those created tremendous changes in the culture that were very positive long term. And, you know, that what, what really determines it is staying optimistic not in denial, but optimistic that this is going to be of great benefit long term. That's not to diminish the short term challenges, but also to, to stay um, lighthearted, you know, in, and that doesn't mean not taking it seriously, because right. I guess kind of circling around, we talked about the dangers of mm-hmm. it's the end of the world or right. it's nothing. Right. Well, and we, we've got one minute left. I just would like to really, really thank all of you for coming. But if, you, if you're leaving, and I, I'm going to go right back to you really quickly, Michael. If you're leaving viewers with one thought, um, what is that? We're going to get through this together. Yeah. Absolutely. And contact the Council on Aging, right? If somebody needs something, the school district has a website, and I am so happy to know about all the mental health services available. Um, it's so much support, and, and you guys have been wonderful. Um, I just encourage everybody to share this, this video around with everybody and, and right-size their fear, right? That's it. Yeah. Beautiful. I learned that today. I'm reframing. So, um, and I'm taking deep breaths and I'm grateful for all of you. So thank you very much. And uh, maybe we'll do a follow-up. So thank you. As we wrap this edition of uh, In Studio, the Zoom edition, I want to thank all of our guests for being here. And I want to thank you, the viewer, for watching. And so if you do want to share this program with others, you'll find it on YouTube and at uh, WSRE.org. I'm Sherry Hemminghouse Weeks. I'll see you on a future edition of In Studio. And in the meantime, stay safe and be well.